You're listening to Tapestry, a podcast by a music lover for music lovers. I'm your host, Kelly. Join me as I learn more about the common thread that weaves throughout our lives, music. Welcome to episode 18 of Tapestry, where I sit down with Kate Pavley, who is the namesake of her own group called Finding Kate. And she is based out of London, so she's actually my first international guest on Tapestry, and I was um, very glad to have her. So we're, we're reaching beyond the U.S. But some of the topics I cover on today's episode include her upbringing in both Australia and Cyprus, a little bit about her new album, and some of the challenges that both the U.S. and the U.K. music scene are facing. You're listening to her latest single off her upcoming album called I Feel Bad. Thank you for having me. Um, I am across the world right now, and I feel very honored to be your first international guest, so thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here, and I think you basically described my music exactly the way that I feel it is. It's kind of dark, alternative pop rock, Um, and yeah, my name is Finding Kate. That's my stage name, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you more about different things. Yeah, well, I definitely want to find out more about Finding Kate. And I know um, your your story sounds kind of interesting just based on, one, where you are now. You're in London yes. right now, correct? Yes. And then when I was doing my research, I know you kind of have ties to both Australia and to mm-hmm. Cyprus. I am yeah. super curious about that. So did you grow up in Cyprus and then move to Australia or tell me about... Vice versa. So it actually okay. happened the opposite way. And everyone always tells me they find it an interesting mix. And it is an interesting mix. I mean, both countries are super hot. Um, <laughs> so, um, And I'm in London, which is a bit crappy and grey, but yeah. I'm here for a reason. But um, yeah, I was born in Sydney, Australia. My dad's side is from there. And then when I was about five, we moved to Cyprus. And I'd say I pretty much grew up there my whole life from about five to 17. So I lived a big portion of my life in Cyprus. I speak Greek as well. We speak Greek there. It's just a different Ooh. dialect. Yeah. Um, it's a very beautiful small island. And then I moved here when I was almost 18. I moved to London. Yeah. Okay. So you've been here for a while. It wasn't like a recent, oh, I'm no, just, yeah. just got up and left from Cyprus. That's so interesting. Was, um, was your dad in the military or something or how did you end up going there? Um, no, my dad wasn't. I think because his family, so like if we go way back in his family, he had Cypriot roots. So somehow he met my mom. I do, still don't fully understand how, <laughs> um, to be honest. It's one of those stories where I'm like, what? What do you mean? Um, but they met when they were like 16, 17, and then they got married at 18. And then, yeah, we moved to Cyprus. I think it's just a, a great place. I mean, I, I'll speak well, I think in general, it's a great place to grow up. It is relatively safe compared to bigger countries. I mean, of course, there's occasional crime, like there's some drama right now happening. We could talk about that later with some serial killer, but we never, oh. ever have that shit. Like, Cyprus never hears that. So it is a very safe place, and I loved growing up there. And, of course, in every country, you know, you'll have one or two. Well, I'm sure in America you have a lot. We have a lot in London. Um, it was just an awesome place to grow up to grow up and I really love Cyprus like I love going back for holidays so I'd say yeah it was just probably a better place to bring up the kids my brother and I and yeah safer I guess Hmm. yeah I I I gotta say I don't know a lot about Cyprus but it always looks like such a beautiful place and now I imagine though so obviously you're a musician and at some point in your youth you probably decided hey i I want to learn to sing or play an instrument or something. But um, mm-hmm. since you were already in Cyprus at that point, did you ever feel like you were kind of insulated from everything? Because, I mean, it is literally an mm-hmm. island. Did you ever feel exactly. kind of disconnected? That's a really good question, actually. Um, 
And yes, so I, when I was about 11, I started doing like singing lessons, piano lessons and all that stuff. And I was about 14 when I took part in Cyprus Has Talent. So it's like a mini version of like, you know, America's Got Talent, Britain's Got Talent. Um, And I won that, but I I was the junior winner and whatnot at that time. But it was, it's, that's why it's not really anywhere on the internet because it wasn't a massive competition, but it did open up some like really, really good sort of opportunities and doors for me. And that's where I met my current producer that I'm actually still working with almost seven, eight years later. Um, His name is Chris. And I met him through Cyprus Has Talent and all that. Um, Yeah, and I I mean, there are opportunities in Cyprus within the music industry, but it is very isolated and you do have to work even harder to sort of get where you need to be. There's not a lot of venues. There's not a huge sort of scene no big radio stations. It's all like commercial stuff. So yeah, it was a little bit more closed up there. Cyprus is still a little bit closed up with certain things. Yeah. Right. Now, culturally speaking, though, is Cyprus, um, you know, musically, cuisine wise, all that stuff, is it a little bit closer to like Arabic culture or the Mediterranean side of things? Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of both. Um, it's definitely more on the Mediterranean side of things. So we have a lot of Greek influences. So um, because we speak Greek, it's a different dialect. We have, uh, well, I remember even growing up listening to different Greek artists. Um, and there's some really cool, like sort of traditional Greek artists, Greek music. Um, so yeah, it's, it, is, it is still a bit Arabic inspired. You can hear that. I mean, I think I, I seem to realize the older I get that so many genres are intertwined and there are so many influences, you know, like world influences. And then you've got your far Eastern sounds and you've got your sort of Mediterranean and your Arabic. There's just so many different countries that in the end, when you actually listen to it, you're like, wow, it's got influences from everywhere. Um, So yeah, I'd say, but the main one is definitely a sort of traditional Greek background, but in Cyprus, they, they do listen to a lot of English music and they're just a little bit later a bit, a little bit, um, sort of slower to receive, you know, the big hits, and especially in the rock scene, they don't really discover new rock artists, unfortunately. Interesting. So then, that and that's kind of what you do. I mean, I, I had had yeah. you, um, I had had you list some of your influences, and to anybody out there listening, this should direct you to Kate's music because it's great. But um, your influences include bands like Flyleaf, Carnival, mm-hmm. Evanescence, Hailstorm, Pink, Audio Slave, those types of bands. So yeah. if you're kind of growing up in a place that's getting them like three or four years later after they're popular here in the U.S. and in the U.K., yeah, did you ever feel like that kind of stunted you from making the music you wanted to make? Um, I feel like it, it, it didn't stunt me because luckily I, my dad, I mean, I, I say it in all my interviews, uh, my dad kind of brought me up with a lot of good like rock music. And it was, yes, a lot of the stuff was a little bit older, like we were listening to Pearl Jam and Audio Slave and, you know, Sound Gardens. And then it got me into the sort of new metal stuff where we were listening to like Linkin Park and, you know, Evanescence. And then I got into like Pretty Reckless and Flyleaf. But yeah, I think that seeing now where I am in London and how many new artists and bands I'm discovering, like you might've even heard, I mean, even the pretty reckless people mm-hmm. in Cyprus still don't know them. People in Cyprus still don't know Flyleaf. They just never got to that recognition. It's such a niche genre for them right. to listen to. And like even highly suspect, I don't know if you've heard of them now yes. recently. Yes. You know, no, no one in Cyprus, very few people would know them. And actually it's a little bit annoying, I think, there because we only, I think they only got Spotify maybe three years ago. So it was quite late to even get Spotify. So yeah, I feel like it is a little bit difficult for artists. But because I moved here when I was about 17, I'm, it's been about five years now. Um, I kind of, yeah, immediately was like, whoa, look at all this music. There is just <laughs> so much music out there, you know? Yeah, the door just, com- like the floodgates opened. Exactly. That, yeah, that has to be one of the best things about streaming services in general. You can say what you want to say about them, but yeah. music discovery to me is like one of my most favorite, treasured things. So 100%. I can't, I can't imagine yeah. living in a place where you're sort of sheltered from that. Mm-hmm. But either way, so okay, so you um, you started to sing. I'm guessing when you were younger. Do you play any other instruments as well? Yeah, so I started singing, let's say properly, well, I guess singing lessons when I was about 11. And then um, I started piano again, well, when I was 11. 
Um, so I guess my main two instruments are singing and piano, although singing is kind of my main thing. Piano is a bit secondary. And then I can play a little bit of guitar, but not very good guitar. I'm pretty shit at guitar, to be very honest with <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. You're, um, now you have a backing band and everything. Like, yeah. you, you just sing whenever you're doing your stage stuff as Finding Kate, right? But how did you come across your backing band? And are they like That's... close friends of yours? Um, so th they actually vary quite frequently, the musicians. Um, so there was a time where I had, when I was in Cyprus and I had, you know, quite a few shows before I left where I still use the same musicians, but they vary. So it could be like a recording where I use one drummer and then I have a live show here with another drummer. So I have, let's say three or four people for in each instrument that I know I can rely on. They're all super, super talented musicians. So like currently I have, Nanek, who's been with me for many, many years playing guitar, but I've also got a guitarist in Cyprus called Elias, and they've both done, you know, sometimes someone will record on, and someone's recorded on an album, someone's recorded a live session. Then I've got a bassist, like my brother is now my bassist, oh, nice. who joined about two years ago, but then I've also got, you know, there's just so many different people, but I think uh, they all know how special they are to me, but it, it's, unfortunately, they, are, they do work as session musicians because, especially my drummers, I've got three or four different drummers and they're all insanely talented, but they are, are all session musicians and they all play with other artists. So when they're unavailable, I can't not do a show. I have to make sure I've got someone available. But yeah, there's certain people I've played with, you know, even five, six years ago. Other people are more recent, like Dennis is one of my new drummers. James is one of my new drummers. And they just kind of come in and out, but they're all very, very special and all completely different styles to be honest as play players and as people yeah now being that you've lived in three different countries now have you kind of i mean i can only i can only imagine your networking skills <laughs> because uh, i imagine you probably have people like literally around the world that you could call up and go hey i'm i'm in this place right now could i get your yes. help with something is that true it kind of is now uh, with musician wise a hundred percent um especially cyprus in the uk I haven't really got the connections I wish I did in Australia. I think it's because I left when I was so young and it is so far. And I, I only went back when I was 18. So I hadn't been back for 13 years and I went back and my family were like, whoa, you're a woman now. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. I am a woman now. That's what happens. Um, <laughs> yes, exactly. It was just really weird. Like, oh my God, these are my cousins, my, my grandma. And it was so sweet. But I just don't have that kind of connection where I was going every year or every two years. So even if I wanted to play there, I'd have to, you know, just find different musicians, network. But I think Cyprus in the UK, because I'm always back and forth in Cyprus, there's not many venues. And my producer, Chris, he's definitely a steady member of my sort of, let's say, backing band. And even though he doesn't play a lot of shows with me because he has a studio in Cyprus, I always know that he's always going to be there for me and he he has very good connections in Cyprus as well. You know, there's a few venues that I will always go play at. And then here I've kind of, it was pretty difficult when I first moved to London to build these connections. No one knew me. No one had any idea who I was. So I struggled the first few years and I'm still, it's still pretty difficult here. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Well, what was the, the catalyst for you moving out of Cyprus and, and going to London? Um, initially it was, I mean, I kind of always knew since probably I was about 13, 14, I, 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 when I discovered Avril Lavigne, I sat in my room with my little CD player and I was like, you know, reading her lyrics from the booklets, just <laughs> back and forth and kept repeating the same album. Um, and since then I was like, I want to be like Avril Lavigne. I want to be a solo artist. I want to be a performer. And I think after all those years, you know, Cypress has talent. Then Chris at the age of maybe I was about 15, 16 was like, Chris initiated writing an EP for me. So he was like, I want to write songs for you. That was, I was quite young then. So I wasn't really, I was writing, but it was awful stuff. So I never even shared any of my ideas with him. So yeah, he wrote four songs, which really, really suited me. And like most people don't even know to this date that he wrote them for me. And I just wrote like a few melodies, a few lyrics. And then, you know, I was doing these little things here and there. And then he we decided we were going to make it into an album. So that four song EP became my album in 2016, If I Fall. Ah, okay. Yeah. So it's kind of starting to make sense now. Um, and that's when I was a little bit more involved with a few lyrics, a few melodies. Um, I had a lyric co-writer as well called Ruchel, an amazing songwriter. But 
yeah, that's when it sort of started to kick off. I think 2014, 15, 16, where I was getting serious and I was like, "Uh oh, I've got an album now. (laughs) I just moved to the UK. I was, well, actually the main, going back to your question, sorry, I've kind of gone off tangent and you're an absolutely amazing listener. You're just letting me ramble on. Thank you. But um, uh, yeah, you're asking very good questions actually, I must say. Mm. Um, Yeah, so when I'm, I was initially moving here just to go to music uni. So I was like, oh, I want to go to music university. I found one in North London. Um, it was called ICMP and I was like, I'm going to move there and then I'll make those connections, meet musicians, you know, start my band and whatnot. And I moved, well, I can't remember when I moved now, but probably five. Yeah. So right before the release of the album, I moved here, but that was the main reason I said London. I, I want to, let me be honest. I, I do want to be based in America as well for a while. I want to try out the States and London was just easier because, it was close to Cyprus and I knew that I'd have that ease of access to the studio, you know, the support of my parents. They're so close whenever, you know, when I need a break, I can just go for two, three weeks there and I don't have to travel for, you know, hours. Right. You're so, still, you're yeah. still in the EU. You can still kind of, exactly. it, it's so much easier to travel over there, at least from what I hear. Yeah. A hundred percent. So yeah, I think the main thing was to come to university. I joined university for a year and then I dropped out. So what was um it was it a totally different picture than what you imagined or did you just kind of feel like you could sort of make some of those organic connections on your own without having to necessarily go to school for it that was a, that's again a good question i i thought it was good so i went on to a creative musicianship course i didn't go on like a standard you know bachelor's in vocals i think the the more like you know vocals guitar based where you just go to be a very good performer are amazing but those, I think, are for more people who want to be kind of amazing session players and like, you know, the drummers and, you know, people who want to be absolutely insane at their instrument. But I think the course I was on was really good. It was it was to be creative. I had to, you know, co-write with people. We had to do different genres. You know, one week it was dance, one week it was country. But in the end, I was, I don't know, I just felt like it wasn't what I expected, as you said. And the connections were good. I still have some connections to this day. And I did meet a lot of musicians there who kind of played with me. They don't really play with me anymore. A lot of them, sadly, didn't work out. But yeah, I just, I, the main reason I quit was just to work full time. I thought I'm not improving myself as a rock and pop artist. I'm writing with other people, but I felt like my skill wasn't improving necessarily. So I thought might as well work, make some money and then keep playing and just at least if I'm making some money, I will be able to inject that back into my music as opposed to going to uni and not being happy and paying all those shitty fees, you know? Right. (laughs) Right. What was the, uh, the drudgery of choice that you took when you were paying your way? Um, do you mean what job I chose? Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Um, wait, I guess, I guess, I guess I made an assumption that it was drudgery, but a lot of people, you know, when they go to university or college, they're like, uh, I'll just take any, whatever crappy job I want to. Um, I've, I've been a waitress for many, many years. Um, a lot of people don't know that I just stopped waitressing. So I was working full time cause you know, with waitressing, they, they, it, it's not always the best money. Sometimes it's, you know, extremely stressful mm-hmm. restaurants, depending on where you work, of yep. course. Um, I'm sure we've all experienced it. Yeah. But I, I just, I just worked it. a catering event this ah. past weekend. It, I, I feel for any wait staff, it is a very difficult job. Yes. Yes, and even sometimes I occasionally still do catering events, even though it's not as frequent. But when I was a full-time waitress, I had that ease of, because, you know, it's a restaurant, you can just say, I need flexibility. I need that, you know, I I have a show this day. I need to book it off. I can't come in today nine to five. Whereas if I went for a nine to five job, with my sort of thing, I kept going back to Cyprus for one or two weeks. You know, I keep having shows. I just felt like a lot of nine to fives were like, "Mm, you need to be here every day. You can't keep asking for it because, you know, with shows, I don't want to be working nine to five and then going to a show at 7 p.m. That's going to tire me. So I kind of knew that with restaurants, I'd have that flexibility. And it's fun. Like, I feel like I it it made me a stronger person working in a restaurant for, you know, different restaurants all these years. It kind of changes you, I think, and changes your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've always worked back of house. So I've actually about the only thing I haven't done is wait. But. I've worked mm. with, you know, tremendous waitresses and waiters over the years. And yeah. um, I, at least 
at least here in the U.S., and I'm sure this goes for just about any culture, I think everybody should work in a restaurant at least once in their life. Yes. It, it totally changes your perspective on how to treat people, how to talk to people, um, how to speak with people who, you know, I, I try not to be a judgmental person. And sometimes yeah. you just never go, you never know what a person's going through. Exactly. Yeah. And I think being a in wait staff kind of like helps you understand that a little bit better. But it's so true. I totally agree with you. And I think all wait staff, all bartenders, we all say it like if only people worked for a month in hospitality just to see what it's like because yeah. you get a completely different perspective and you you do have to persevere a lot of the times through of course every job has its own difficulty I'm sure office jobs and whatnot everyone's got struggles and whatnot but having to it is long hours you're always on your feet um and yeah I mean you just always got to kind of be happy and you can't <laughs> be moody and you can't complain and you've got to just work 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 and have 50 things on your mind and also people don't understand they'll sit there sipping their wine while you're trying to do your clothes down so you can go home and they'll sit there for an extra hour oh, yeah. and you're torturing you and you're just like can't you see that you're the only people left in the restaurant yep it's just very sad and then they'll walk over being like oh sorry did we keep you up yeah, yeah. girl <laughs> girl you kept us up what do you mean but yep. yeah <laughs> the last restaurant I worked we had a waitress who her very it was her very last day and the next morning, she was leaving on a cross-country flight to Alaska to go oh, work God. on a cruise ship. And this this elderly couple stayed in the restaurant until we closed. Oh, An hour God. after we closed, and she was, like, vacuuming around them. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to yeah. send the message politely, like, please wow. leave. I have to go home. But, um, so, I'm sorry. It's just bringing back memories. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough job. But... So I guess I could find a way to transition that into something music related. I actually think mm -hmm. about this a lot. I feel yeah. like there are a lot of similarities between the hospitality industry and the music industry. Mm -hmm. And as I'm kind of getting my toe into it, because I'm starting to get into band management and just becoming more involved in the music industry, it can be nice. pretty predatory and pretty um, yeah. difficult to navigate. So when 100%. you were when you were starting to get into this, like, what were some of the, I guess, observations you made? And were there any things about the music scene you were in that sort of made you go, am I sure I want to do this? Yeah, so uh, it's a tough question. Um, yeah, I mean, even to this date, there are, also I'm a Libra. So like, oh, I really me too. Me are too. When, when's your Yay. birthday? October 21st. Ah, mine's October 10th. That's awesome. Oh, that's amazing. That's so cool. And I always make jokes, like if my brother's listening to this, he'll be like rolling his eyes at me. But I, you know, some people just like, what? Um, I, what was I saying? I'm a Libra. Oh yeah, I'm always, you know, you're just so indecisive. Yes. Fucking indecisive. <laughs> it, it kills me. You you make a decision, you wake up the next morning. No. Oh, it's just, uh, 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 back and forth, back and yep. forth. Your brain is like battling every day. It's just an absolute, and I find that that makes, you know, I wish I was one of those girls who's like, yeah, I'm going to do this and just does it and doesn't care what people think, you know, and I'm just not that. And I found that in the music industry, that's a struggle that you've got to, it, it's like you make a decision, you stick to the decision. I can't tell you, even before I released I Feel Bad, my latest single, I went back and forth, back and forth. Do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? Going back and forth to my management, then to Chris, I had so many stresses and and if you think about it, and I say even my parents are like, there are far worse things to be stressed about. And yep. it's true. The music industry, you get sucked into it and you just see like stress, stress, stress. And I feel like when you're doing so much stuff on your own, you know, I don't have a label injecting thousands and thousands. And my managers are in the US, funnily enough. Oh, okay. um, So the communication is a bit difficult. They've only just started managing me. They are very great. Um is Jim from 307 Management and Sean Milk from, I don't know if you remember the band Alessana. Yeah. Yeah. So they're managing me. So it's a joint management and they're great, but they don't live here. And, you know, sometimes yeah. I just want to call them up and be like, I just want to moan. Right. Uh, so it's back and forth through emails and they've, they've been very, very great. Um, I'm very grateful to them, but I feel like, yeah, there are a lot of things to think about when going into the music industry and I've had a few interviewers recently been like, what's the best piece of advice you can give someone when joining the industry? That, that's it's literally like, a question on my sheet right now. So you can oh go God. ahead and answer it, I guess. I can go ahead and answer it. <laughs> um, it's just uh, 
So I guess you've got to have thick skin, as they say. And I used to not have thick skin. Three, four years ago when I first released my album, I was very, very touchy. If I saw something that, you know, and still to this day, I'm still a little bit touchy with certain things. Like, of course, no one wants to see an average review. No one wants to, no one wants to get a response, which is like, okay, cool. Or, you know, someone not interested. You want to get good things because you've worked so hard for something or actually it's even more disheartening for me as an artist where people don't answer, you know, they just don't answer their emails. And I'm sure you've seen it too. Yep. You've experienced it. We've all experienced it. And it's not just the music industry. It's like even people I'm sure in offices in the business world where it's just like, answer your bloody email like just tell me no yeah, thanks I, exa- or, yeah and you know what though that you know, is a really hard skill to learn because I yeah I used to be that way too and I think it's that it, it's so funny I don't I don't really play into the astrology thing but at the same time <laughs> I'm such a typical Libra and everything yeah. you're saying you're typical Libra too um it's the the fickleness and the the fear of rejection Yes. Um, and then you also sound like a perfectionist, just like me too. Yeah. So my God. it can be crippling, but no, it really can be. And it's like, and it's also that thing of not being a control freak, but yeah, you've got, you want that perfection mm-hmm. and you are a bit of a control freak because of that. And you might sometimes come across as, you know, people always tell me, Oh, you're so driven. You're only 22. You've got your mind straight. And it's true. The only thing I think about and not in an awful way, it's not like, oh, I have to be famous. It's really not about being famous or making shitloads of money. It's just, I want to get to the stage where my career is good enough, where I'm, you know, making enough money to just live off it and just keep creating and not have, you know, 50 part-time jobs. You know, it's Mm -hmm. just getting to that point where you're very, very comfortable with it and enjoying it. Because a lot of the times now you don't get to enjoy it because you, you have to do so much for it. So yeah, that's why I guess I'm so driven and I'm sure you're driven too. You just never stop. I no, I never do. I mean, I I have a, a promoter friend I work with, um Julia. I know you're going to listen to this episode, so I'm shouting out to you. I love you. But um oh, nice. <laughs> she she's a very talented promoter and friend of mine and she uh um she texted me today and was like, "Hey, um you know, let's chat soon cuz a lot of times I'll like design um posters and stuff for local mm. flyers and everything." And I said, Dude, I literally cannot. Like, I I mm. have every hour of my day for the next five days planned out. And if something, oh. God forbid, happens, I'm screwed. But exactly, yeah. I, it's just constant. Like, I get home and I work on something. And mm. um, I don't know. Maybe you're the same way I am. I wouldn't have it any other way. Like, I just... Yeah. I, I sometimes do need to remember I need to slow down and de-stress and yes. just actually make some time to relax. But... Um, it's very hard when you have a personality like yours or like mm-hmm. mine. So um, you were saying that kind of yeah. made you like butt heads with, well, not butt heads, but you know, you, maybe you have some creative differences with, let's say, your producer, or your manager, or something. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Was was it important to you? Like after you found Chris, mm-hmm. was it really important for you to find somebody who kind of works the same way you do, or did you want somebody different to sort of give you a different perspective? So with Chris, the thing is, Chris is one of my best friends. He's probably my best friend, to be honest. I I don't have that many friends. It sounds very sad. But um, <laughs> um, I do have friends, but they're kind of spread out all over the world. So my best friends are back home in Cyprus. And I barely see them. But I know when I see them, it's amazing. You know, I've got my different bandmates. But again, we don't see each other very frequently. So a lot of the times, especially now I work from home. So I started pe- teaching people vocals. So I'm a private vocal coach now. Oh, good. Um, only about a year ago, actually, it's been since last May that I've been doing that, but still on the side, I still do occasional waitressing jobs and catering jobs, you know, just to keep myself afloat. But yeah, I, I, Chris is my best friend and it, it works out well for us because we have a really good connection and he's very honest with me and he's, there's been times where he's seen me so down, he's seen the worst of me and he'll be like, you've got to get back up. You've got to not care and just like shut up and like get, get on with it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but like yeah. empowering me to just, he's like, because obviously he believes in me and I believe in myself. But as you said, there's days where you wake up and you're like, what am I doing wrong? You know, having this constant like just worry. I think it's just a lot of stress. But yeah, we've, we, there's been times where we've clashed, of course. I'm sure any creative person will clash with either bandmates or producers or whatnot. But we always have the same vision. And that's what's important to me. Like with I Feel Bad it was like, it, it came from me. I just sat down on the piano. The chorus was exactly the same. And then 
he, he was in my flat here and we were going through my songs. So we have so many songs where I have a lot of songs which are sort of incomplete. So I've got like a verse and a chorus and some chords and then he'll go into them and just help me arrange them and come up with different parts and whatnot. So yeah, there's been times where we've clashed and be like, I like this, I don't like this. So we've argued and, you know, he will be like, this performance wasn't your best. You weren't believable enough. And I, and like, you know, I'll cry cause I'm so sensitive <laughs> and I know he's telling me for my own good. And it, it's, yeah, we don't really argue. And even with my managers, like the, it's a very recent relationship with them, but I do trust them. And we did have a little bit of a bump at the start because the reason why my single took quite a while to be released was because I didn't know which was going to be my first single. We had sort of divided opinions. I had another track that was kind of on the verge of being my first single. And I kept saying, I really want, I feel bad. Basically the one that's out now was my initial instinct. And I was like, please, please, please. But they always said to me, like, if you're not happy with something, don't do it. So in the end we did, you know, it it was kind of, it, it, it ended up being my way, you know, but well, I think yes. that's I think that's most important at the end of the day. Yeah. You know, you're 100%. you're the creative force behind finding Kate, so hopefully you would get to make the final decision. But well, it sounds like it kind of worked out in your favor though because, you know, you you've had some features, you've been in some magazines. Yeah. I I the yeah. one that um I was really psyched about was you were I think it was Black Velvet magazine um yeah. with with Delane and I love Delane. Yeah. Oh, amazing. So, thought that was extra cool. Uh Kerrang, stuff like that. So, um in in working on this upcoming album, and also I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. Is I feel bad also the name of the full album? I know that's the single, but um, um, it's not. So actually, uh, my sort of strategy now is to do a lot of singles. Okay. There's no album planned yet, and I know it sounds weird. There will be an album eventually, of course, but for now, like my managers and Chris and I were like, no, let's focus on doing four, five singles, and then seeing, uh, like, we'll know from I Feel Bad in the next one or two how it's going to shape up, and then I can start planning for an album. And I hope that my album won't be called I Feel Bad because I've realized <laughs> that um, my first album was called If I Fall. I, I Feel, feel Bad. bad. <laughs> It's just, I, 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 f, 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 it's just constantly I, F, I, F, I, F. Um, so yeah, I think it might end up being something different. Hopefully something a little bit more outside the box. Well, I'm, I'm glad I'm not going crazy then. Cause I, I was doing my research and I'm like, why can I not find the name of her upcoming album? That seems yeah, like a, no. that seems like a pretty important thing to know as an interviewer and I couldn't yes. find it anywhere. So, okay. That's good to know. You're just releasing yeah. singles now. Um, yeah. So that being said, you know, I I come from a very metal background. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't listen to a ton of pop, but the the whole thing in my kind of musical world tends to be people will write albums to be listened to start to finish. You know, mm-hmm. this has some overarching theme or concept and you sit down yeah. and you listen to it in one fell swoop. So I, I've honestly never heard of someone just writing the singles and they actually kind of don't have the album mm-hmm. at the end in mind. How does that how does that take a toll on your writing process? Like, are you, you know, are you comfortable with that? Or are you concerned? Um, so I'm not concerned. Um, I do have, to be honest, there's quite a few songs at demo stages. So there are another seven. So to be honest, I've got about 10, which are ready. They just need to be final mixed. So yeah, I'd say that, that they are kind of, they're going towards the album direction. So what you said is a very good question. And yeah, those other seven, again, it, it is, the, the plan is for all of these to go on an album. So yeah, it is always in the back of our minds, in the back of mine and Chris's mind, that they still need to have some sort of similarities so that you do say that story, as you said. But I think with this one, they're all quite individually, you know, they're all quite special and different, which... Of course, we need to make sure that not every single track is like, you know, single banger, you know, mm-hmm. where they all stand out. But then even with my first album, it's they, they do tell a story. But for some people, it was like, oh, they're a little bit too similar. But it's like, yep, yeah, but that's an album, you know, it, it tells <laughs> a story. So you, you, you can never win. And I think uh, maybe with these ones, a lot of people will be like, oh, that's different. That's different. They're all I think a lot of people are not going to expect the sort of sounds that are going to be coming. But in the end, I think that the core will be similar because I'm using the same producer for all of them and because he arranges a lot of the parts. So even if I've written the whole song, the chords and whatnot, the arrangement comes down to him. He'll write 
the drum parts, the guitar parts, and I'll, you know, have some input and be like, I want the guitar to do da 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 da, but that's mm-hmm. it. You know, I'm not yeah. gonna actually, and like maybe have some piano riff ideas, but other than that, because he's kind of the main person who arranges it and puts my pieces together, I think that there, yeah, there will be definitely a similar vibe at, on the end products for sure. Like, and that's in the back of my mind. It has to have um, a nice sort of start to finish vibe. Yeah, Chris, kind of Chris yeah. is kind of the glue that's holding it together, I guess, with his input, so yeah, to speak. Yeah, um, so was there something that kind of made you, you know, after you released your first album, did you have some major life event or something that just kind of compelled you like, all right, I'm ready to start working on the next album? Um, no, I think it was, I can't remember how it started. I mean, I always kind of wrote a few bits and balls, but I never, even at university when they used to make us, you know, they'd be like, I'm pairing you with a drummer. You need to write this. You need to do that. I was writing them, but I was always so embarrassed at uni because there were some people who were just such good songwriters. You know, one week they'd come up with an amazing dance song and then the next week they'd come up with an absolutely incredible, you know, folk song. And I always was like, Mm, I'm not the best. I was always like doubting myself, feeling like, oh my God, shit, why am I not, why am I not writing <laughs> so many good, you know, genres? And I thought, but you're not, you're not, your aim is not to be writing folk dance and whatnot. So I was still writing at uni, nothing amazing. And then one day I think I played something to Chris and he was like, do you have more stuff? And then I started playing him a few recordings. He's like, I want you, please, please keep writing. I said, I will, but I'm not ready to share my stuff with you. But yeah, I think that different things that happened in my life kind of pushed me into it. But I've always had it in me. I just never knew how to get it out. And the better I sort of got at piano and just sort of playing and not thinking, oh, I'm taking my grade five piano exam. Let me play like a robot. Mm -hmm. Um, Just playing. And even if the chords sound shit, even if the rhythm's shit, you're just playing and creating. It just, yeah, different sort of bits and bobs. And I think different stresses and, yeah, I think those were the different events that kind of, I think moving different houses a lot, because that's not the first house I moved. I've, apparently, I've come to London and I, I don't know what's wrong with me. I keep choosing weird, weird people to live with. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're not listening to this now, but if they are, I'm sorry, guys, you're all lovely, but you're all really dirty. What, were they like fellow creatives? Because that's the other thing I thought about when we talked about the restaurant industry. There's so much drug use in the restaurant industry. Oh and then there's a lot of crossover in the music industry as well. Yeah, I'm not even going to get into that, but you are so <laughs> right about it. No, there weren't creatives, actually. Funnily enough, I've never lived. I li- in my first house when I went to uni, there were creatives. And they were actually the nicest girls that I've lived with. We were all at uni together doing different courses, all musicians, all from completely different countries. So that was probably the best time. And actually, you don't realize that London, and I'm sure, it, where are you from? What, what city do you live in? Uh, I'm, I'm right outside of Pittsburgh, PA. So we're okay. uh, not, uh, to be honest, not the most diverse of American cities. We have a lot of like, yeah. we have a lot of Indian and Asian immigrants, but that's mostly because of, um, mostly because of the colleges here. Okay. Well, yeah, it was just L- London living and the flats and the house shares are very, very stressful situations. So yeah, I think uh, it was, I didn't realize how blessed I was to be living with those girls in our first year. None of us knew how shit the housing system was. <laughs> we all had our own ensuite bathrooms. The apartment was pretty new. We were complaining about, I don't know, like some stupid shit like oh the sink is clogged and then the more houses we all moved to the more we were like oh my god that house was so good and <laughs> comparatively speaking oh, yeah you just there's so much so many bad properties here so many bad landlords it's just yeah and that cool. just does it does take its toll on you like it really does yeah no i was just thinking that's why i mentioned like how not diverse pittsburgh is because yeah. I, you know london's an international city so you're getting people from different countries, different yeah. walks of life, immigrating there. And um, I mean, I hope this doesn't sound offensive, but that gets stressful. I mean, you're mm-hmm. trying to shove a bunch of different people of all That's different just... cultures under one roof, yes. expecting your needs to be met. And it's like, no wonder you're stressed out. Plus, exactly. when you're, plus when you're in college, you're never quite, you yeah. know, you're just kind of like living on the edge, trying to pack everything into 
one day i feel like and yeah I, god i don't miss that at all though um okay. i really appreciate what you said though about how you know you did the most writing when you were under the most stress mm -hmm. and that's i've brought this topic up in a couple of my interviews because i want to write music and i just never do and and mm -hmm. most people say exactly what you said they're like just do yeah. it it doesn't matter what it comes out like just do it so exactly um when it, being that some of your influences are you know heavier mm -hmm. more aggressive stuff and that kind of influences your sound like have you always kind of carried that with you like that that love of heavier darker stuff have you carried that with you along the way to sort of help you manage those stressful times in your life yes definitely um and you know I listen to a lot of also pop stuff and more alternative stuff and and funnily enough, a lot of the times Chris is like to me, well, the things that you write, a lot of the times your melodies are quite pop. And without realizing, I'm like, oh, shit, really? Okay. <laughs> That's why, you know, my stuff does have a commercial element to it because naturally from within me, I'm not writing super like experimental weird stuff. But then that's when Chris comes in because he was, you know, growing up listening to like, well, not even growing up in his, you know, in his youth, he was listening to like Silverchair and Soundgarden and Live and all these, you know, melancholic and if you listen to silver chair you'll be like okay i can actually see a lot of my songs kind of have a similar vibe to it but a lot of people don't know silver chair you know because they weren't well they were quite I, big i only know silver chair from another podcast i listened to and ah. they were doing an episode in australia and there was like a whole five minute tangent about silver chair <laughs> oh my god yeah yeah no they're great but yeah as you said like has this type of music while well, listening to sort of heavier bands help me yes it has and I think like we all will say music is an escape and you do when someone pisses you off and you just put a song on and you know it also helps you cry as well and if you're feeling emotional there's certain voices and certain artists like nothing but thieves I don't know mm. if you've heard of them oh I, my god long long time ago but yes wow his voice and it's again it's softer it's a bit more alternative a bit more pop rock when Connor opens his mouth, I just get goosebumps and <laughs> I want to crawl into a hole and just listen to his voice. So, yeah, and it's I think the different mixture of genres definitely has helped me just deal with different things. And I mean, I, I think when I was younger, funnily enough, I used to listen to Alessana and I used to listen to, you know, Bring Me the Horizon and Asking Alexandria for like, I think one or two years when I was about 14, 15, I wanted to be cool. And I was like, oh, I was one of the first you know, in Cyprus, not a lot of people would listen to them. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then after a while, I was like, what am I doing? It's not me. I'm not <laughs> loving it. You know, it's just too much for me. No offense, guys. Like, it's great stuff. It's just, and you know, now sometimes I'll listen to like a bit of architects and, but my most sort of extreme stuff is like, it's not even, I don't really like vocals that are not melodic. So even architects, it's a little bit melodic mm -hmm. carnival. You know, Carnival is super melodic as well. Um, obviously, I used to listen to stuff like Metallica and all of them. But yeah, I'd say the stuff I, I love emotional vocals. I love to have like a melody that I can sing along to. That's why I listen to so many different artists, like even Banks, who's like alternative pop. I listen to RYX, who's like ambient pop. And then I will listen to Avril, still love Avril. I'll listen to Pink. And then I'll listen to Lacey Sturm from Flyleaf. Yeah. And you know, all these different artists, they've all kind of helped me in different ways in different sort of times of my life. Yeah. Huh. I know that that resonates with me a ton, just mm. going through phases now. And, and I don't know what you're like in your personal life, but uh, I, I'm the one who has the office job and I have to get dressed up and wear nice clothes every day. And I just look yeah. like your average normal person. And then like I get out of the office and I'm blasting death metal in my yeah. car. So it. Yeah, that that connects with me. You kind of like find the things that help you get through your life, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. And that's I, I mean, that inspires you to use music as your language. Um, I did want to ask you some other stuff about touring and performing out because mm -hmm. um, I don't you know, I don't know really much of anything about what the music scene is like in London and just mm -hmm. in general. I'm sure it's booming and thriving, but um, what are some of the shows you've gotten to play and, and what has that been like? Um, so I've played a mixture of shows. Some have been very, very good. Some have been good and some have been pretty shit. <laughs> um, I'm <laughs> going to be honest. I'm not going to lie. So I've played some really, really nice shows. And I think the highlights that I've played so far are 
Um, I played one with Hands Off Gretel, and Hands Off Gretel are starting to create a very good buzz for themselves. And I'm going to play two more shows with them. They're really, really fabulous. If you like sort of more grungy, garage, punk rock, it's just, they're amazing, and her voice is insane. And I'm really looking forward to that. I played with um, an Italian band called Half Lives, which is kind of like Paris style, a bit more like pop rock. Hmm. dancey kind of synthy stuff and then I've had quite a few good headline shows myself I find that my headline shows in Cyprus were very good as well because I like every two three years I'll go back and do a big one at one of the big venues and you know bring 200 250 people but so like people people would be expecting you kind of back in Cyprus yeah so there's been shows where they've been very very good in Cyprus some you know 150 people at least because it's kind of like I'll, I'll go heavy on the advertising there and people kind of know me and yeah. they've been pretty successful because I don't do them very frequently. But um, here, yeah, when I first moved here, I was kind of taking every show I could. I was like, yep, yeah, cool, cool, cool. And I played a lot of venues which were not very good and you, a lot of bands can get away with it and they're like, they don't care because they've got like a sort of thrashy sound and they don't, you know, they don't have clean vocals either maybe. But I found it's a big, big struggle because my songs are quite, low and then really high and long notes that I need to have a very good sound because if I don't the whole thing will collapse doesn't matter how good my musicians are doesn't matter how tight my drummer is or how you know good their stage presence is if they're flying up and down like you know monkeys it (laughs) if the vocals are not 100% the show will suffer because it you know my songs I don't know if you heard my first album I I, uh, I got about halfway through it the other day, yeah. yeah, and and I feel you on that. You are yeah. very like you. A lot of your songs rely on your voice. Exactly. So it's kind of like Evanescence as well. And it, if there's a slight slip in like the sound and you're slightly out of tune, it's very obvious. You know, I cannot get away with being out of tune. It's always going to be a hundred percent. You know, there. You know, there's certain artists they can open their mouth and they can be out of tune, and no one will care because it just suits their music. They can do weird like slides and breaks mm-hmm. with their voice. With mine, it's kind of like no, it's got to be there. So I found that a big struggle when I first moved here, where I was just taking on whatever shows and being like, doesn't matter what PA they have, doesn't matter who the engineer is, doesn't matter the stage size. And then the more I did it, the more I realized, okay, I'm not making money. I'm paying musicians. Um, some shows I wouldn't pay musicians. Of course, I've had like obviously really lovely people being like no you don't you know just pay my food just pay my travel but all in all the amount that I had to spend to play those shows and not see return was not worth it and then I started to filter them out and be like what are the good venues there's like small shitty venues which are more like pub sounds then there's medium good ones then there's medium very good ones and then you've got your large you know Wembley's and your Brixton Academies which everyone wants to play but you've got to be you know pretty famous to play there so but at the moment there's a big problem in London because not just London actually all over the UK and I don't know if it's the same in the States they're closing a lot of the venues a lot of the medium-sized good venues Mm -hmm. where they've got good sound good location they're just closing them because either not enough people are going or because they're building new flats of course uh that that is a problem here one of my very favorite venues here in pittsburgh was called the altar bar and it was actually <laughs> it was a medium-sized venue where i actually got to see some some bands from uh great britain um and it yeah. was it, it was in the belly of an old church and so the sound was fantastic it was you know nice mm-hmm. acoustic it was great and um they shut it down because they wanted to turn it back into a church and i'm like there's probably four churches all on the street, you know, like that's really cool. come on. That's so so nice. that's interesting though, that that's a, that's a problem over there too. Oh yeah. It's, and because it's such a small country, if you think about the UK compared to the U S mm. it's a big problem. And we're all like, Oh my God, what is going on? The scene. I feel like everyone says, Oh, the UK scene, UK scene, the scene, everyone's realizing all, all reviewers, all magazines, we're all like, Oh my God, what the hell's going on? Like <laughs> it's not a lot. You know, it's just a strange time now, I think, in the UK. Is uh, is that something that, like, across genre, you're finding that musicians you talk to are all really aware of? Or, I mean, is it like this bonding thing between musicians? Like, hey, we got to do yeah. something about this. I think there is, like, a mutual sort of, oh, oh, like, it's starting to kick in now. What are we going to do? Like, one venue closed it, I think it was called The Borderline. I can't remember which one, but another one that I did not expect just was like, oh, we're closing our our doors for the last time in months and everyone's like what the hell hmm. so I think a lot of us are aware of it and it's just you know I think 
a lot of artists will always be able to play. There's certain bands, there's certain styles like indie rock or, you know, the sort of softer pop ones or like synth based ones that they, they'll be able to play at any venue and they'll be fine. Right. But I think a lot of us in the sort of more rock grunge alternative are kind of stuck because we're running out of venues to play at. And if we do play at venues and we do put nights on and whatnot, a lot of the times the venues don't even promote them. And even my dad was saying, I don't understand because he's been to a few of my shows and he's like, I don't understand why these venues, even the good ones, why doesn't someone go and give flyers out, promote the event and be like, this is a venue, this, you know, these bands are playing. Right. You can't expect the band to do or the artist to do all the promotion and the venue makes one post and then you're like, okay, so why are you not going to promote it? It's just very strange. A lot of the venues don't share it and they don't talk about it and then they'll do it on the day being like, oh, Finding Kate is playing with us tonight. It's like, wow, thank you yeah. for sharing yeah. 10 hours before the event. Like, thanks. I'm going through that right now. I'm, I am bought plane mm-hmm. tickets to go stay with a friend who's in a band and it's like it's like three weeks before the show and the promoter hasn't mm. said anything about it. And I'm thinking, just, oh. hmm, I wish they knew I just dropped a lot of money to fly to oh go see God. the show that was you know, kind of told to me hearsay, I guess, Mm -hmm. like, um, uh, that's, that's so crappy. Cause it, it, the thing I learned from that whole experience is like, it doesn't help the bands or the artists. It doesn't help the fans and it doesn't help the promoter or the local music scene at all. So it just blows my mind that promoters can drop the ball. um, Yeah. It's so true. And there's very few, like, honestly, the only promoters that I trust in like Andy, I work with him now. I'm working with him on my show on Friday. There's like a handful of promoters I can trust. And, but even though, even if you've got a really good promoter, the venues themselves, the promoter will send them the poster. The promoter will be organized, set up the fit. Basically the promoter and the artist will do everything. And then a lot of the times the venue just doesn't care. And it's like, why would the venue itself not share the artist poster or right. make some hype? You know, how much can the promoter and the artists do, of course you get both where the promoters just don't do anything. As you said, usually the artist is the one doing everything and the promoter or the venue just don't give a shit enough or you get a combination of, if you get a combination of both, like that's the worst combination that the venue doesn't care and the promoters, basically you might as well not even go play. Yeah. You know? I think they just think it's, it's a given that, well, we're always going to have performing artists who want to come play here. So yeah. we don't really have to put in the legwork. And I think that's, that's so unfair. And that's why those, that's why those doors close because Hmm, I wonder why you aren't bringing people in. Like, I, I don't know if I don't know if the UK has this too, but here in the US, a lot of shows are either eighteen, um, yes, you know, eighteen and under, and like that is a huge problem in my mm-hmm. opinion because you you close off a lot of market oh that God, could yeah. otherwise get to a show. Um, and so yeah, sick. yeah, you have promoters that just don't give a shit, and it's a shame. No, it's so true, and actually, it's like. I understand, you know, uh, let's say big concerts at Wembley and whatnot, that they'll be like under 14, you know, under 14 is accompanied by an adult, under 16. You know, they let them go into the venue at these big events, which are actually scary a lot of the times. You hear what happens at these big arena shows, some real fucked up shit. And then you've got small shows where it could be like your cousin wanting to come or, you know, one of my students wants to come and he's 13 years old and he can't, they won't even let him in with his dad. Hmm. It's like, what's good? Yeah. Touch wood, like what's going to happen at these events just let the kid come in don't serve him alcohol obviously anywhere yeah. you go they'll ask for your id they'll be like if you look under 25 we'll ask you but we're obviously allowed in the uk to drink alcohol from the age of 18 whereas you guys it's older yeah from yeah. whatever yeah but it's just yeah. silly like because you are as you said closing off i've had at least 20 people who i know could come to my show but they can't because you know they're just not allowed even i'm like what if their parents there? what are they going to do they're going to wear ear defenders. I just don't get it. Right. I'm actually know. going to a show with my mom this upcoming week, two shows with my mom in, in Toronto mm-hmm. this upcoming weekend. And I was like, mom, are you sure? Are you <laughs> sure you want to go to this crazy metal show? She's like, oh, I don't God. care. I'm down for anything. But um, yeah, that, that makes me mad. It really does. Because I've talked to even some like teenagers, you know, I'm 28, but mm. people that are 17 or 18. I mean, I still feel like yeah. culturally, like I can talk to them about stuff. And it's like, mm-hmm. so many people miss out on opportunities just yeah. because, Oh, I haven't turned 18. You know, I turn 18 in four months and, uh, it's just so I can't go to a show. 
Yeah, I feel especially at these shows. You know, with these shows, it, it's like you've you've got to have your fan base there. You've got to have that super deep connection with your fans. And if and we know how important and how influential these kids are, and how much you know how much they're on their social media and how much they're on their Spotify and their phones, and the fact that they can go to Billie Eilish, who's already you know making millions, and they can all go watch her, but they can't come to one of you know their friends or their cousins or whatnot show because they're not old enough. It's really hard for the artists or the band to be like, you know, we've, we've just lost a chunk of our fans because they're not allowed in because of some silly rule. Let them come in with their parent and, you know, it's just silly. You're closing off such a big market by, and it's, you know, I understand the venue doesn't want to serve alcohol to them. It's not like they're going to make money if 20, you know, 15 year olds come in, Yeah. but the parents will be there and there will be a busier bar. It yeah, just... I, I totally agree. I don't understand why that stereotype is the way it is, but mm. I mean, I hope, I hope, I hope your scene cleans up and uh, you get some places opening again, maybe that are all ages or something. That would yeah. be nice. But uh, what what show are you playing this Friday? Um, I'm playing at the Monarch in Camden, so it's uh, kind of for the release. So it's like a single release party, and it's free entry. So people can't complain <laughs> about paying a ticket. <laughs> nice. you know, a lot of the times we don't want to pay ticket prices. But no, it's a pretty good one. The venue looks really cool. And Andy, m- my promoter friend, is helping me organize it. I'm playing with my amazing, amazing band. Um, I'm, and I'm just really excited for it. Um, it should be good. I'm doing a pretty long set, about an hour. So, yeah. That's, that's awesome. Tough. Yeah. If you, um, if you had to open for any act, who do you think it would be? Like if you got the chance, Evanescence. Oh, oh, yeah. good answer. <laughs> yes, like I'm. An, everyone's asking me that question, and I think I'm always going to say Evanescence because I feel like I'd be a pretty good opener for them. And you know, a lot of the times, people will always, no matter what I do, be like, "You sound like Evanescence," and it's like our tones, our vo- vocal tones, are nothing alike. But as soon as they hear a, a melodic voice with long notes, they're automatically <laughs> like Evanescence. And it's like, oh, guys, our, her voice is like compared to mine is like this soft, pretty, you know, angelic voice. And there's mine. I'm more comparable to like Adele than I am yeah. to Amy Lee. If, do you know what I mean? If yeah, I can sense. hear that. I think or it's like Lady Gaga, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's just um, a lot of people tend to kind of put female singers all in yeah. one box, which is really stupid. So. And that's that's actually a, a good segue into the, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you. Um, so we kind of got in touch through the uh, the GBTRS group, which is Girls Behind the Rock Show. And I love the concept of that group. I think it's great. And that it's pretty much like a networking space for um, women who are, you know, we're we tend to be minorities in the Mm -hmm. music industry but it's just for women who are like running the soundboard or doing lighting or musicians themselves and i think that's great but um have you ever had like a crappy you know misogynistic run-in with someone or i mean i hope not (laughs) but i have uh, see the thing is yes and no because a lot of the times i feel like it benefits you to be a woman a lot of the times because a lot of people, I know it sounds weird, a lot of, of course, unless they're creeps and they're just <laughs> there to, you know, watch your ass or whatnot. Because um, I have had, you know, there was one show where I think my mom was there and my brother and someone else was there and they were like, you know, your leggings were a bit see-through. And I was like, well, so? okay. So I was like, all right, all right, oh, well, my mom was laughing and I was thinking, uh-oh. And then, yes, there could have been men in that audience because, you know, they will come with their cameras and their phones and their little video cameras. And they, some of them could be filming it and being weird about it, but there's nothing I could do. And it's like you're putting yourself in the spotlight. You've got to accept. And, yes, I go where I, I wear crop tops sometimes. I'll always keep it classy. Like, I'll never feel comfortable. You know, I, I've seen some acts where they've actually gone up, like, you know, they've taken their bras off and, their you know, their boobs are out and, you know, and they just don't care. I'm not like that. Good for them. Cool. I don't <laughs> care if you do that. I personally wouldn't do it. But even for me, like, I like – to look and feel good on stage. But there's been like once or twice where I wore something where I was a bit like, oh, I shouldn't have worn that. Like <laughs> a sort of um, mesh thing which barely covers the sort of boob area. And it's <laughs> like, and I was wearing like a, so it was covering my boobs, but the rest of my body felt pretty exposed. And I was like, I remember feeling like, oh, like, and I saw the pictures and it looked good. And I was like, okay. But other than that, um, based on how I feel, you you know, as a woman, even if you're not in the industry, you walk around, 
you do feel scared and you do feel like, why is that man looking at me? Um, why are they, you know, you're walking past them, they're saying something to you and you ignore them because you're like, oh my God, just please don't make eye contact with me. Or you're just walking and maybe you smile and they think, you know, so you always get this shit being a woman and I'm sure some men get it too. But I think in the industry, I haven't seen it as a negative. I haven't seen anyone being weird because I'm a woman. I've seen actually a lot of people supporting it and a lot of people like the sound of a woman's voice. A lot of people I think maybe relate to female vocalists more because it's more, maybe it's slightly easier to listen to. I know a lot of fans that I've seen a lot of discussions on this on Facebook where people are like, should it be a female fronted band? Should it be? Yep. And it's like, I think there are worse things to worry about in my opinion. It, I've been called female fronted band. First of all, we're not a band. So for me, it's like, okay, whatever. Cool. Cool. Um, I now go off this saying I'm a female solo artist with a band. But even when they said female fronted, I was like, it is that. And I understand they won't say male fronted, but I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a weird topic. I haven't personally experienced anything. It's a bit touchy, you know, for a lot of people, but I haven't experienced anything that's made me been like, Oh, I haven't been selected because I'm a woman because there are so many opportunities and so many like competitions and things I've gotten into and gone far. And, you know, someone will get selected before you or maybe your songs, you know, because they maybe have a more suitable song or they're getting that festival slot because they're more suited to the festival. And yes, some festivals you look at it and you're like, whoa, there's not enough women on that lineup. I don't know who affects those decisions, but because I'm not at that stage of my career yet where, you know, I could compete or trying to get into download right now. I can't be like, oh, there's not enough females on download festival. Plus, I think there's just in general less, I seem to think, less female musicians than males. That's what I've Mm -hmm. realized anyway. I'm sure that there is like, I don't know, 10 or 20% less. And that's like minimum, I would say, musicians. So we've we've just got to accept that there's less of us. But when we do it, we just you know, just be good at what you do and shut up. Like, does it yeah, matter? I, I think that's a totally realistic opinion to have. Yeah, I guess I guess I have to rethink about, I don't want to say rethink about asking that question because it's like, well, I don't ask my male guests, you know, yeah. how do you feel about male-fronted bands? But I, yeah. I mostly ask because I really like hearing women's perspectives on it because, you know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a woman in the music industry too. And to me, I, yeah. I kind of go right up the middle. Just be good at what you do and don't, don't assume yeah. that because you didn't get an opportunity, it has anything to do with what's between your legs pretty no. much. But eh. And, you know, I've seen actually even on that group that you said we've met through the GPTRS and you've seen a lot of bad, you know, some women I'm like, whoa, you know, reading weird stories yeah. where someone didn't, you know, didn't give them the job because it did. And I think maybe um, it happens to a lot more of girls behind the scenes, maybe like tour managers or photographers, maybe, or people who have to sort of get personally involved with male fronted bands or with you know maybe an engineer or something for me it's like I go to the show yes there's been times where I've been trying to say something to the engineer maybe he doesn't take me seriously first of all I'm not good at bullshit I don't know anything about sound yeah so when I go to the venue and I'm sat there like uh, I don't know what I want <laughs> and I'm like Chris come help me and he's like sending me the tech list and I pretend I know I don't know my musicians <laughs> know better my producer knows better but other than that I've been quite lucky because I don't have to go face to face or be put in an awkward situation with, you know, an engineer who will like, well, luckily touch with nothing's happened yet where someone's put me into danger or whatnot. But of course you've got to be so careful because there are predators everywhere mm-hmm. and there's weirdos everywhere. And, uh, you know, I feel awful for all those girls who have had to experience just so much shit. But I think the opportunities as a, as a solo artist or as a female fronted band aren't less if you're sending a good email, if you've got good music, I don't think it matters. I think you actually have a benefit because if a man gets it, they might be more interested i don't know like it's a weird one i'm not saying you're gonna get more response because let's say you're a sexy female because it's not like it's you know all of a sudden everyone's like oh my god you know you look good so i'm gonna listen to your music it really doesn't work that way but yeah i think it's very sad if you see you know a lot of women who've had to you know they've turned down jobs or someone said something to them or hurt them in any way but i think that happens in all industries and the ones which women have to get involved with a lot more men, you know, maybe their bosses or maybe they're whatnot. And it just sounds awful, but luckily I haven't experienced it yet. So I hope I haven't said anything that will, you know, offend anyone. I don't mean that in any no. way. At- no, you and I kind of share the same opinion, honestly. I, yeah. I'm, I'm more of an egalitarian than I am a feminist, though I obviously heavily 
heavily support women in the music industry yes. and just yes. just going out and being your best self, I guess. But um, I don't know. It's it's really all labels when it comes down to it. And I guess that's actually like a great wholesome way to uh, wind things down. I'm glad you haven't had any crappy, Yay. you know, misogynistic <laughs> experiences no. so far. But um, typically, I always like to end my interviews with this. But um, if you could only choose three albums to listen to for the rest of your life, you had to be stuck with just three, what would they be? And why? Um, it would be Avril Lavigne, Let Go. Um, <laughs> solid Avril choice. I would always <laughs> choose an Avril album. Like, um, it's a weird one because to this day, I just still love her. And I listen to her latest album. And yes, a lot of the songs are a bit cheesy, very cheesy lyrics on the latest one, I've got to say. Um, Soz Avril, I don't know if you're listening to this. I still love you. <laughs> I don't think you're listening, but if you are, hello. Um, yeah, other than that, Let Go is just one of those albums that I just love it. And it just really speaks out to me. And I relate, I still relate to the lyrics. I still relate to the production. I think a lot of this stuff, because Chris and I had this argument one day where he was like, do you think she wrote everything on that album? You don't know how many people were behind each song. I was like, no, you know, she's the perfect like, singer songwriter girl. I'm sure she's done everything on her own. And then we went in and we saw how many songwriters were for each song. And we're like, oh, OK, no. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of different there's on like four different songs, there's four different mixing engineers and there's someone who produced it. So there's just, but I was like, I don't care who's done it. All I care about is that it's a, such a solid debut album and the songs are so good. Like pff, losing grip, unwanted, I'm with you. And I just, it just brings back memories from when I was like a teen sitting in my room, as I said, reading her lyrics. So that's number one. Okay. Um, number two would be Evanescence. Again, it was tough to choose between all of them, but I'd say The Open Door. Um, oh, great album. I just love that album, and I feel like it didn't get enough recognition. Well, it, it did, but there's just, like, All That I'm Living For, Lithium, Cloud Nine, and I think Weight of the World. There was just so many good tracks on there, and I love the artwork as well. Like, I just remember holding that digipack with her wearing that beautiful dress, and there's that open door, and something about that album just, like, it kind of calls out to me and I love the production on it. Um, I feel like they did some really cool stuff on it. So I'd say definitely, and Evanescence is, it will always be my favorite band. I just don't like to keep talking about them because I'm always. Because <laughs> you're you know, compared to them. Yeah. And it's like, guys, they're actually, I sound more, you know, even I feel bad. It sounds more like the Pretty Reckless or Flyleaf. Yeah, or Tonight Alive or something. Yeah. Even. Yeah. So I'm always like, oh, I try to avoid saying Evanescence, essence, but yeah, they are definitely a huge part of my life. And Amy Lee is one of my big, big, biggest influences. So yeah, I think the open door. And then the last one would be um, a very recent album from the last three, four years. Um, Nothing But Thieves, their debut album. Mm. Yep. Um, so it's just called Nothing But Thieves. It's got a horse on the cover, very simple. And it's just sick. I just... <laughs> can't get over there are so many good tracks on that and I never get bored of it and a lot of them just speak out to me and as, as I said before his voice speaks out to me it was quite difficult to choose because obviously I have so many artists that could have said but I thought this is a good one and I had an interview the other day with someone asking the same questions that's why they're kind oh, of oh okay yeah. yeah I was surprised that you were like oh here's my three yeah, a lot no. of people are totally <laughs> blindsided by that but yeah no I didn't think I I mean, I don't want to choose completely different ones every time. I'd say there will always be a solid Avril one, Evanescence one. And then the third one, yeah, I was like, oh, my God, what do I say is the third one? <laughs> it's just a bit tricky. But, I mean, I could have even said, like, Pink, even I'm Not Dead is great. Oh, but great, great album. See, every time I ask this, I, I always ask it at the end, and then I, like, want to wrap up the interview and go listen to all those albums because, oh, well, you know, a lot of times I know them, but most of the time I don't. And it's like, oh, now I have... Now I have something new to uh, 100%. check check in on. So, well, but yeah, I'd say nothing but thieves, pink, basically all, even pretty reckless and hellstorm. But let me be honest with hellstorm. Like, I love hellstorm. What, what's wow. your favorite hellstorm album? Uh, I don't know because I love bits and bobs from every album. I haven't fallen in love with a full album from hellstorm yet. To be like, hmm. it's amazing. I know it sounds weird because hellstorm or hellstorm and. They are such a good live band, and Lizzie Hill absolutely has the craziest voice ever, man. Like, shit. And they're <laughs> insane, but I feel like 
I yeah, I'm not like obsessed with their whole albums. I can't even remember what it's called. Is it not the Curious Case? The maybe? Miss Miss Hyde or whatever. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that, I yeah. Think that's probably the best one in my opinion. The latest one is very good. It is. But again, I feel like, I mean, yeah, they're not like in my top top bands. They're they're in like sort of my second tier bands. They're, <laughs> they're great, but yeah, I don't love every single song of theirs. There's certain songs where I'm a bit like. Mm, a little bit cheesy for me. I uh, I really like that you also have the second tier. Th- it must be the Libra thing. It's the the <laughs> the brain organization. Like yes. I have to categorize all the music I listen to, and I, I have so you know. I know you actually have some Spotify playlists. I have a billion Spotify playlists. Oh like God, it's it's amazing. actually like a bad obsession of mine. Um, so from it's so true from one Libra to another. Um, I, I really enjoyed Better Libra party. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation and um, oh, me too. Man, Thank you so much. Man, I hope if you do make it over to the States someday I could like pull some strings and have you open for butcher babies or hailstorm or something it would be great that would be sick that would just be amazing well thank you so much yeah Um, thanks for joining me it's been great all right folks there you have it there's my interview with kate pavley and you can find her on facebook and twitter under finding kate her instagram is i am finding kate and you can find her on spotify and anywhere else you listen to music by searching for Finding Kate, also at her website, www.findingkate.com. As always, thank you for listening. Oh,